<laughs> a plethora of children to bless. What a good do. That's what it's all about. Boys are doing woodwork again today. Learning how to be carpenters, like the boss. What a beautiful time. Father, we pray blessing over our children. We pray diligent teaching over our children. It's so important we get the word into them and they grow to be strong in that word and they know you, Father, know you, intimately know you. Starts at a five-year-old. Five-year-old kids in the first century knew Leviticus cold. Don't underestimate your kids. Don't underestimate your kids. You just need filling with the word. Amen. So Father, bless them today. I pray they have a beautiful time. We've got Manuela teaching. We've got Johnny teaching the woodwork. Chrissy's helping. Are you helping Piglet? No. No, not today. Good. Simone. Simone. Simone's helping. And Ava, there you go. So the little, little kids as they were, they're now growing up and starting to be leaders. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. So Father, bless them today and keep them today. Keep them safe all week and bring them back to us again. Amen. Yeah. Hope you have a good week. Holy days. Holy convocations is coming into the springtime feast, uh, springtime, autumn time feasts. Spring for us, because we're down here. But um, Feast of Trumpets, really important. Really important. It's a time of... Oh, excited, eh? It's a time of repentance. It's a time of stock take. It's a time of checking where you are with the Lord. Come back home. And, 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 and trumpets is all about the Lord blowing the trumpet like an alarm and saying, time to come home, kids. Time to get cleaned up. Yom Kippur. He washes you clean. He washes your sins away. Who's our Yom Kippur? Yeshua. It's different for us. We're not like Judaism. Nothing to do with Judaism. He's dead as a doornail. He'll sit in synagogue all day reading prayers for nothing. They've got to get there, because they've, oh, they've, they've got to be in the book of life. We're already in it. Yeshua's our covering. He's our kippur. Kippur, covering. Like, like they wear a kippur. Covering. He's our covering. He's our atonement. He's our propitiation, if you want King Jimmy. Whatever. <laughs> covering. We've got everything to celebrate. It is a somber day in a way, though, because, you know, there'll be a day, you know, when that trumpet sounds, maybe on a feast of trumpets, just taking a shot in the dark at that one. But if he dies on Passover, and he's buried on unleavened bread, and he rises as our first fruits, on first fruits, nothing to do with Sunday, everything to do with it being first fruits. And then he gives us his spirit, on Pentecost, 50 days later, Pentecost, 50 days, all kind of makes sense, doesn't it? His first advent. Well, there's going to be a second one because it's prophesied and he will fulfill it. And I'm just taking a stab at it, but maybe that day is going to be on a feast of trumpets when he comes back. Oh, you don't know the day or the hour, aren't you? No, but we know the season. We know the season and it tells you in Matthew 24, doesn't it? There'll be a great shofar blast from the shofar of God. God's going to blow it. God's going to blow it because he's saying, Son, it's time to go. Let's go and get the bride. Like they did in the first century. When he went to the bride and he said, I'm going to give you this in a wine. And I'm going to tell you that I love you forever. She was under no compulsion to take that wine. But if she did, she's saying, I'm going to love you too. That's what we're doing when we take the wine. We're saying we're going to love you forever, Yeshua. Because he's already said that to us. It's beautiful, isn't it? And then he goes home. And he builds a place on the back of his father's house. That's Jewish culture. 
You've got to know the culture, right? I've built in many rooms in my father's house. If it wasn't so, I'd have told you. But only when the father says, only when the father says, and the father blows the shofar, that's when he comes. And he takes a big entourage with him to gather his bride. Feast of trumpets means so much. Yom Kippur, he's our covering. And then there'll be a feast, like a wedding feast, five days later. Once he's made atonement for the world, and he will make atonement for the world. Make no mistake, he's coming back with fire in his eyes. He's coming back for his bride. And he's coming out to kick the snot out of anybody who doesn't believe in him. Make no mistake, he's a warrior. He's a warrior. He's our knight in shining armor, but he's a warrior. And he will come back. And then we'll have a wedding feast when he's tabernacling with us. Maybe on a feast of tabernacles. Just throwing it out there. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? That's your Bible, people. Nobody teaches you that in the church. Because it's Jewish stuff. Come on. Wake up. Smell the coffee. Smell the coffee. King's coming back soon. It's time to celebrate. So it'd be good if you came on the feast days because you're kind of showing up when, when he does because he promises he will. It's Leviticus 23, it's a blueprint. It's a blueprint. And he will fulfill it. Amen. We've got the wonderful Beth. Bev, sorry. Beth? Bev. Beck, Bev, oh. not had enough coffee. There she is. We even put it on your Berean call for you. So you remember. We forget what we tend to remember. And remember what we tend to forget. Don't we? Something like that. Coffee. Coffee. There you go. Get a cup of coffee. You might have figured it out. This, work, this week, the word is about love. It's all about love. Why? Because it's got to be what we're all about. That's why. I hope, I hope you feel that when you come through here. I hope you feel that. We need to feel it individually. We need to feel it as a body. Because if we don't have love, what are we? Just resounding gongs, right? Right? It's something everybody wants. It's something we all desire. To love and be loved. It's ingrained in us. It's inbuilt. It's part of our spiritual DNA. Much more than emotion. Deep, deep heartfelt need. It's a must, in fact. Necessity much more than something we just like we absolutely need it the sad thing is some never find true love the true love that everybody wants desperately but unfortunately they never find we should tell people we love them but if you're going to tell them you love them you've got to show them as well Love's like a doing word, isn't it? Show them you love them. You shouldn't really say it without showing it in a practical way. So you show them loving your actions, because talk's cheap, isn't it? And if you love, truly, truly love, then that love should be unconditional. can't attach conditions I'll love you more if that's self-serving it's opportunistic selfish I heard a quote the other day about the faith
The faith started in Israel as a fellowship. It moved to Greece as a philosophy. It grew and it went to Italy as an institution. Rolled on into Europe as a culture. But by the time it got to Australia, it was an enterprise. An enterprise. A business. And we're the body, aren't we? Well, what do you call it when a body's a business? Prostitution. That's not what the church should be. The church shouldn't be part of the world, should it? Should be in it, but not of it. If we say we love, we should show it. That's fair. And if true love's true, you've got to operate in unconditional love. Expecting nothing in return. If you give love, it's not a guarantee of you getting some back. Loving someone makes you vulnerable. And I'm guessing there wouldn't be too many here who haven't been hurt by somebody who was supposed to have loved them. Betrayed by spouses, some betrayed by the spouse. Some hurt by the children, some children have been hurt by the parents. Workplace colleagues, employees, employers, some by the friends, some have hurt the friends. I could go on and on and on, you get the idea. The reality is we've all hurt somebody at some time. And maybe we've got an inherent talent for looking for love in all the wrong places. That's the problem now. And there's no guarantees in life. Some people have great relationships. But they too can fall apart. You might think they can't, but you can't control another person's emotions. You're getting wet, Gav. No, I didn't. We've got we've got one in the we've got one in the storeroom. Same deal. Mm. you can't control another person's emotions and decision making it can and sometimes will fall apart I'm not I'm not in love with you anymore and they just up and leave I, I, I did a job down in um, in Mandra not long ago there was a guy from Sydney just moved over He'd been married 50 odd years. He said she just, she just woke up one morning and sat on the side of the bed and said, I've had enough of you and I'm going. And she just got up and left. He had no idea. He just did him like a freight train. And um, ended up splitting up and selling the house and everything and he moved over here to one of his kids it was just devastating for him you know don't love you anymore it's done it's devastating crushing well, that's what makes you vulnerable isn't it when you get involved in a relationship no guarantee because we're human we're finite we're vulnerable Well, here's the but. There is no love in the universe that can compare to the love of your heavenly Father. 
loves the very heart of God. He is love. Deuteronomy. Adonai will do to them what he did to Sichon and Og, the kings of the Amori, and to the land. He destroyed them. Adonai will defeat them ahead of you. And you are to do to them just as I've ordered you to do. Why, why do you suppose that seems pretty sort of full on, doesn't it? You, you've got to understand who these people were. These people were giants. These people were sick, evil, evil. Pregnant evil. Very, very intelligent. Very, very evil. And they had every debauchery going. And he had to wipe it out. He had to get that off the land. It wasn't arbitrary. So be strong. Be bold. Don't be afraid or frightened of him. Why? Because I don't know your God is going with you. That's why. I didn't leave a failure. Nor abandon you. This is on the cusp, obviously, of him going into the land. This is his word. And we all know it. We all know the word. How authentic your Bible is. We, we, we teach over and over and over. You've got an authentic Bible, so I'm teaching to the choir. But this is a faith walk too, isn't it? We walk out our spiritual lives by faith, not by sight. Literally a faith walk. When, when that trumpet blasts and that eastern sky cracks open, then, then we're believing by sight, aren't we? And that's what we're waiting on. That's, that's the blessed hope. It doesn't matter how much bibliographical evidence, historical, archaeological, whatever you can come up with. There's still some people just not going to want to know. And you might not ever be able to give that somebody enough proof. But don't let them ever let them disprove it to you. Daniel remained resolved in extreme paganism extreme paganism we're still there kept his faith don't ever let them disprove it you put them back on the witness stand you prove he's not you prove he's not we've got more proof for the flood than all this Big bang crap. All of it. Oh, a T Rex. It evolved into a chicken. That's in textbooks. I'm not kidding. You want to believe that crap? Wake up. Intelligent. I'll never leave you. I'll never fail you. I'll never abandon you. Just after that verse, he's saying, I'm, I'm going to go before you. I'm going to clear the path. Not only then, I'm going with you. He's going before you. You're not walking it out on your own. Deep, these scriptures apply to you. You can claim them. Because you're Israel too. You're in the commonwealth of Israel. Ephesians 2.12 You understand Ephesians 2.12 You understand Romans 11 You'll get the Bible. You'll get first century belief. Very, very important. You're grafted into the olive tree. You're grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. You get to claim their covenant. You get to claim their words. The ring. Their promises. You get to claim that. If you're not grafted into it, where are you? Where are you? 
Because, you know, your, your ship's got no anchor and you're, and you're drifting. It gives you an anchor to your soul. You're not walking out on your own. He's going to go ahead of you. He's going to be with you all the way. He's never going to fail you. He's never going to abandon you. 31.8, it repeats. It's he who will go ahead of you. He will be with you. He'll neither fail you nor abandon you. He's repeating it. He doesn't repeat things too often. But when he does, you've got to pay attention. Don't be downhearted. Don't be afraid. Don't be downcast. Don't be sad. Don't be lonely. He won't abandon you. That word's rafah. Rafah. Look at what it means. He's not going to let you go. He's not going to let you alone. He's not going to drop you. He's never going to forsake you. He's never going to show you. He's going to slack off or be limp. He's never going to give in. I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let you go. Even when you think I have, I'm there. I'm there. And I've got you in it for a reason. And you're going to come out of it knowing me more. Makes all the difference, doesn't it? When a mother eagle is teaching her young to fly, she just tips her wings and they, they fall out, don't they? And they're falling, free falling. Do you think she's going to let them grow? Let them drop? Let them hit the deck? Swoops down, picks them up. She doesn't let them fall. The Lord carries us on eagles' wings. Isaiah, right? He says it, doesn't he? Why do you suppose? Because sometimes we feel like we're in free fall. But the Lord's our safety net. You can all bear witness to a time in your life when you, you seriously thought you was in free fall and you're bracing for a crash landing. And then just at the right time, he swoops in and picks you up. Money? He will not forsake you, Azab. He will not depart from you. He will not leave you behind. Let you alone. Abandon you, forsake you, neglect you. Let you loose. Left alone and forsaken, he will not do that. He's always before you. Let's, let's, let's tie the old with the new. Let's go to Yeshua. Let's go to John. My father gave him you to me. He's greater than all. No one can snatch him from my father's hands. Now me, me, me and the father are one. I had one. My Father gave you to me. He's greater than anything. Nobody can snatch you from his hands. The enemy cannot break in and enter. Cannot. No smash and grab. Because you're in safe hands. And we're one. Very, very powerful statement that. When Yeshua speaks, it's like, it's like the Father speaking because they're one. He is the Word of God. The Word made flesh. He wasn't incarnate. He wasn't Yeshua. He wasn't a man. Before he was the Word, he was the Word. Mamre, Hebrew, Logos, Greek. The Word. He went, whew. it was him. Everything got made through that breath. He's the Word. The Torah. You, you, you break Yeshua's heart open, you'll see the Torah. He was known as the Torah. The Word of God.
They're not different. They're not, they don't have different laws. They don't have different rulings. They don't have different precepts. There's no, this is Christ's law now. It's all grace, grace, grace. That, that, who taught you that? Show me. I dare you, show me. Show me it. In your Bible. Because that's a man-made tradition. And you know what Annie thinks about them. They have to be one. If they're not one, they're two. And if they're two, they're going to fall. Because they're divided. Right? Understand, God is one. One times one times one equals. That's how you've got to think about God. Different, isn't it? My sheep listen to my voice. I recognize them. They follow me. And I give them eternal life. They'll absolutely never be destroyed. No one's going to snatch them from my hand. My Father who gave them to me is greater than all. And no one can snatch them from the Father's hand. He knows his own. And they follow him. There can only be one shepherd. Shepherds in Israel lead from the front. The sheep follow the shepherd. They'll absolutely never be destroyed. I'm going to give them eternal life. Now we may have had stuff going on, destructive situations here and there. But we're all still here. So that's a win, isn't it? Still kicking. All the hurt, all the muck, all the mire, you're still here. Because no one's going to snatch you from his hands, that's why. And he's greater than all. You sure as a man could only be in one place at one time. But the father's hand is pretty powerful, isn't it? I'm going to reach out and strike Egypt with my wonders. That's one powerful pair of hands. He did all that to Egypt. And there's never been wonders like it before or since. That hand performed all those wonders. It's the same hand that's holding us now. So don't you dare think the enemy would be able to destroy you. If he could, he would, wouldn't he? If he had free reign, he'd be all over us, wouldn't he? He can take a few cheap shots at you. He might even get the odd sucker punch in. Battles will be fought, but the war's already won. You can't win. Absolutely never be destroyed. That's got to be true. We sure can't lie. Never in the Greek, it's the word ook. And it means impossible. It's impossible to be destroyed. To be killed, to perish, to be put to death, to be lost. It's impossible you're going to be lost. Once you've been found, you will not be lost. It's impossible. No one's going to snatch you. Nobody's going to pluck you away. Nobody's going to carry you off by force. It's not going to happen. Now, do you believe that? Because he's saying, I'm not going to forsake you. I'm not going to lose you. I'm not going to drop you. Not ever. Don't let yourselves be disturbed. Trust in God and trust in me. In my father's house are many places to live. I told you. If it weren't, 
If they weren't there, I'd, I'd have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And since I'm going and preparing a place for you, I will return and take you with me. Blessed hope, right? So that there, where I am, you will be also. Furthermore, you know where I'm going and you know the way. Don't be disturbed because he knows we get disturbed. Some more than others, but fair to say, we all get disturbed, right? If you love me, you keep my commands. They're not any different to the fathers. It's the same word, entele. It's a mosaic law, it's Jewish, Jewish law. It's, it's the same thing. My commands, how can that be different then? What's all this We're under different laws? Where are you getting that from? We're under grace. Of course we're under grace, but we're under truth too. It's grace and truth. 100% of each. I t- I t- the Spirit told me then, and somebody's thinking, oh, well, it's grace, it's grace. Yeah, okay, it's grace. It was truth as well. You've got to have a balance. Because one's greasy, and a slippy curry, and you can <laughs> fall off, can't you? And the other one's nasty and legalistic. But if you find the balance and you stay central to them both, you're going to find Yeshua because that's where he's at. I'm going to ask the Father and he's going to give you another comforting counsellor, like me, the spirit of truth. You can't have the grace without the truth. He's going to be with you forever. The world can't receive him. Neither sees nor knows him. But you'll know him because he's staying with you. And he's going to be united with you. I will not leave you as orphans. I'm coming to you. You had to go, Mary, let me go. I've got to go back. One man on his own. When he's in Galilee, he's in the Galilee. When he's in Jerusalem, he's in Jerusalem. Let me go, Mary. Because when he goes, he sends the, com- the comforting counselor. Now there's millions of Yeshua's. You're housing Yeshua in your tabernacle. Millions. You'll do greater things. Why do you think? Because there's millions of him. All over the world. Beautiful, isn't it? It's real. Because Yeshua's real. Truth becomes true. Everything he says is true. He speaks about the beginning. He speaks about the flood. He speaks about Adam and Eve. Oh, it's an allegory. No, it's not. If Yeshua is speaking of it as real, as it's happened, if he's telling lies, we're all doing this for nothing. Do you realize it has to be true then? Doesn't it? And that, that's part of the faith. That's your faith walk. But you've got to believe it. You've got to believe. He's not going to tell you lies. He's, going, he's coming back for us. I wouldn't tell you if it wasn't so. Doesn't bounce checks. Doesn't make promises he can't keep. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. Now, here's the kicker. He, he did a pretty outstanding job with the universe in six days. And he's had 2,000 years plus now to prepare a place. I'm thinking it might be quite nice. I'm going to return and take you with me. So you'll be where I am also. It's beautiful. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. Doesn't matter what the world thinks. Doesn't matter. The world's the world. I'm coming to you. He says it in Revelation. 
the end of the book. The one who's saying these things. I'm coming soon. Amen. Maranatha, Lord Yeshua. Coming soon. Some theologians will tell you that means suddenly. I'm thinking it means soon. Not suddenly. He's beyond all time and space. A thousand years is like a day. He's working on an eternal standard. Not ours. But we want everything now, don't we? If not quicker. Such a microwave ping society. I want it now. He's not going to forsake you. He's not going to lose you. He's not going to leave you behind. Don't be disturbed. Don't be troubled. Don't be anxious. I'm absolutely coming back for you. Psalm 118. Very, very messianic. Speaks of when he comes back. Very tabernacles. Without an eye on my side, I fear nothing. What can human beings do to me? Without an eye on my side as my help, I will not, I will look with triumph at those who hate me. Without an eye on my side, it's not really the best translation in the CJB that. If you look at the tree, the tree of the tree of life, it says, I don't know, he's for me. That's better. I will not fear. What can man do? I don't know, he's for me, he's my helper. I'll see the downfall of those who hate me. It's more than he's for you, it's more than he's on your side. In the Hebrew it means he's all around, really surrounding you. From every side. Round about completely, every direction, no exposure to your tabernacle. That's what it means. He surrounded you and covered you, above and below, front and back, spinning wildly around you. But Annie, I don't, I, I, I don't feel like that always. Maybe, maybe you broke out of that covering. Maybe. Sometimes we just want to jump that fence, don't we? See what's on the other side. We always tend to think the grass is greener, don't we? It's just being human. The problem with that is, you know, the dog still pees on the grass, so you get grass stains. It's still gross, so you've still got to mow it, so you've still got to work, don't you? So grass isn't always greener. Those who trust in Adonai are like, are like Mount Zion. It cannot be moved. It endures forever. As the mountains are around Jerusalem, so Adonai is all around his people, both now and forever. Mountains do surround Jerusalem. Jerusalem's on a high. Adonai is all around the same way. The way the land lies there an army could guard any approach you can see the enemy coming from any direction God picked that place and he's literally got his name written on it and he's saying he's all around these people the same way he sees the enemy coming he can't just pick you off like I said, if he could, he would. Something's holding him back. Your strength, maybe? We, we can be very guarded. But you will let your guard down at some point. You can't just walk through life like this, can you? You're going to fall sometimes. You never get any hugs if you do. Very hard to hug somebody when they're like that, ready for a fight, isn't it? At some point you'll drop that guard and <laughs> you'll just get a sucker punched. 
Well, you harder than Mike Tyson. We get tired, we get loose, we get chinks in the armor. But if not for the Lord protecting you, you'd get sucker punched every day of the week. If not for the Lord, he'd have your lights out in a New York minute. Make no mistake. It's all God's grace. It's all his mercy. It's all his kindness. It's all his love. It's all his truth that sustains us. Every breath, his protection. We looked at Job recently. Remember? Things kind of flow, don't they? Adonai asked the adversary, do you, do you notice my servant Job? There's nobody else like him. Blameless, upright, he fears God, he shuns evil. The adversary said, is it for nothing that Job fears God? You've put a protective edge around him. Around his house, everything he has, his kids, his work, his livestock, his land, everything. The enemy's saying that. I couldn't get any for you even if I wanted to. That's our God. And he's doing the same for every one of you. It's not, again, it's not just an Old Testament allegory. This is still applicable. This is your Bible. And your Bible's one, it's a universe. And it means that as a born again believer, a saint... You cannot just be attacked by the enemy any time you want. We can give him access. We can leave that gate open now and then. We can't just break in. If he could have broke into Job's life without God knowing, he, he, he would have he hated Job. He hated him. And God knew it. He knew he considered his servant Job. He hated him. And he hates everybody who loves the Lord. Can't do anything to God. So he's going to push us. Going to try and trip us up. Going to try and tempt us. That's all he can do. Try anything he can to get you step out of, out of that edge. Because he wants to steal God's glory. And he wants to shut down our praise and our worship. When we're hurt, we don't tend to praise and worship too much. And he hates it when we praise and worship God. He hates it. He can't stand it. He can't get it. Well, he'll get it off a few these days. But not from us. He hates it though. He don't want God to get it. But he can't just get him when he wants. And you can't blame him for everything neither. You've got to check your own heart first now. Maybe. Maybe you've got to pull something back. Maybe you've got to do some repenting. That's what keeps you righteous. You're going to fall. Everybody's going to fall. How quick you get up and how quick you repent. That's what keeps you righteous. The Lord never slumbers. He never sleeps. He's never going to get caught napping on his post. But we're spiritually in a war. Paul said, I fought the good fight. It's a struggle. But Annie, I don't want a life of struggle. I just want everything to be rainbows and kittens. Well, you've signed up for the wrong team cupcake. I'm sorry. You just put a target on your back.
doesn't all go great as a believer. Doesn't all go great as a non-believer. Everybody's got the, the problems. They still get sick. They still got financial burdens and woes. They get divorced. They got rebellious children, accidents, same stuff. Happens in the world as it does to others. The, the difference is they, they haven't got any way to turn, do they? We've got a hope we can turn to. They've got no hope. It's that hope that anchors us down. It's always hope. That's why we don't drift out to sea. Because we've always got hope. We may cry. There may be tears in the night. But joy is always going to come in the morning. Right? Joy will come. And it always has. Use all the armor, the weaponry that God provides. And then you'll be able to stand against the deceptive tactics of the adversary. Adversary, ad adversary. Did I put the wrong emphasis on Mr. Labels MB? Yeah. <laughs> it depends where you're from. Yeah. <laughs> We're not struggling against human beings, but against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers governing this darkness. Against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm, the second heavens. That's his abode. He's not this little demon with a pitchfork in hell. Who's in hell? How can anybody be in hell yet? No judgment yet. See? Read your Bible. Nobody's been judged yet, have they? So how can anybody be in hell? You might be in the place of the dead. That's different though, isn't it? He's in the second heavens. The prince of the power of the air. Be careful what your little eyes see then. Spiritual forces in the heavenly realms, so take up every piece of war equipment that God provides. So then when the evil day comes, and it will come, you'll be able to resist. And when the battle's won, and it will be won, you'll still be standing. But we're fighting against these rulers' authorities. And I'm telling you, these are things that nobody really understands. Apart from maybe those who've traveled through the ethereal levels and cosmic realms. Or maybe they just smoke something. Who knows? <laughs> but then they wrote a book about it and you, and you read that book and you believe it. Where are they getting it from? How about you just stick to the word? How about that? We know there's rulers and authorities. We know that from the word over areas. Daniel, you're a greatly loved man. Pay attention to the words I'm saying to you. Stand upright, for it's to you that I've been sent. After he said this to me, I stood up trembling. But he said to me, don't. Don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day that you determined to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words have been heard. And I've come because of what you said. He was greatly loved because he resolved to keep his faith. The prince of the kingdom of Persia prevented me from coming for 21 days, three weeks. But well, Michael, one of the chief princes, he came to assist me. This is Gabriel. So he's speaking about a heavenly realm, right? That Michael had to come and... So Gabriel's a messenger angel. So he's the head banana messenger. Michael, he's the chief warrior angel of Israel. He's not like the Joe host saying he's, he's Jesus. All that. Where, where are they getting that from? Whew. 
assisted by Michael. So you've got angel wars going on. And there's a power, a person of authority over Persia that prevented Gabriel, one of God's best, from coming to Daniel for three weeks. Fighting going on all the time and we know absolutely nothing about it. It's fair? Yes. Angels, right? See that you never despise one of these little ones. Protect children. For I tell you, their angels in heaven are continually seeing the face of the Father. Maybe people who don't love kids don't know him too well. Just saying. They've got angels in heaven. What does that mean? Does it mean that God's assigned an angel to us? Maybe an angel's come between you and the enemy. Maybe you're in a bit of trouble and he's like... Well, that skits out. You got an angel. You need to calm down a bit. We, we, we don't see them, though, do we? Maybe we're too cynical. Little kids do, though. Little kids see them. Hebrews, speaking about angels. Aren't they all merely spirits who serve? Sent out to help those whom God will deliver. Who's that? Us, right? We couldn't make it without them then. You can't make it on your own. You cannot. Psalm 91. Wrong page, Arnie. Get a grip. Get a grip. For you have made Adonai the Most High, who is my refuge, your dwelling place. No disaster will happen to you. No calamity will come near your tent. For he will order his angels to care for you and guard you. Wherever you go. That's for all of us, isn't it? Then the angel of Adonai, who encamps around those who fear him, he delivers them. The angel. Who's that? It's Yeshua. Yes, it is. He encamps around those who fear him. Totally surrounds you, like I said. Delivers you. This is the angel, not a angel. Everybody hits the deck when he shows up. Every knee's going to bow. Go figure. And he delivers. This is our God. This is his character. And here's your take home. We, we, we don't have to prove God's character. We know God's character. And we know there's no greater love than someone giving the best. And he gave us his best. His absolute best. The one who loved the most. The one who didn't deserve any harm or wrongdoing. And not giving up just, just, just for family and friends, but for enemies. For his enemies. You couldn't really care less. That kind of love is special. It's off the chain. Incredible amount of love. He's proven how much he loves us. He's proved his character to us with bells on. What we need to do is praise the proof we already have. Walk it out and pay it forward. 
because we certainly can't pay him back and he doesn't expect us to but we can pay him forward Yehoshua, Joshua formidable didn't do too much wrong strong faith he died like Jacob 110 blessed it's a blessed life The book of Joshua covers 50 years, the time in the wilderness, 40 years. So when the exodus happened, he was just a kid. He was like 18, 20 year old. Just a kid. Raised in slavery, but he saw all the great miracles with his own eyes. So here in Exodus 17... This isn't long after. You see in Joshua, this is really where he shows up in a position of authority. Such a young age. Moshe said to Joshua, Cho choose men for us. Get out there and fight Amalek tomorrow. I'm going to stand on top of the hill with God's staff in my hand. Joshua did as Moses had told him and he fought Amalek. Giants. Giants. Moshe and Aaron and her went up to the top of the hill and Moshe raised his hand and Israel prevailed. And Joshua was the general, 20 years old. Wow. He had some 603, 550 fighting age men he could have chose. Any one of them. But he chose Joshua. We don't know anything about him until now. But it seems he's been chosen at some point to lead the people. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's a couple of things we, we need to be aware of. He didn't get chosen for his military prowess. He got chosen because of his spiritual prowess. Joshua, the son of Nun, who from his youth, he'd been Moshe's assistant. Something about a service that the Lord just really loves. Loves people that serve. Now, I'm not, I'm not trying to guilt trip you because, you know, there's things we can do here. There's things we need here. But I don't want anybody doing anything that they're, they're coming up with on their own volition. I want, I want it to be organic. I want it to be from the Lord. If you're in ministry here, it's because he's pulled you in. I do need a piano player. I could really use a sound tech. Yes, please. <laughs> but really, what we're all about is building into them kids. That's what we're about. Because they're the next generation. I don't want this to die out when we all get a bit older and all the kids bail. I want them to love the Lord and I want them to be full on here. And coming in and, and, and bringing the next, the next generation in. We've got to build into that. We've got to sow into that. Love the kids. We've got, we've got to build into them. And if you're going to serve him, serve him out there. Joshua served Moses constantly. Constantly. Another thing you should know. Exodus 33. I don't know, he'd speak to Moshe face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Then he'd return to the camp, but the young man who was his assistant, Joshua, the son of Nun, never left the inside of the tent. Why? Moses is there in the Holy of Holies having a, a powwow with the boss. Where's Joshua? He's in the tent. He's just hoping. He's just waiting. He might just catch an ember from the Lord. Something, anything. He might just give him a word. He just wanted to be as close to the Lord as he could get. Something, anything from the Lord. And he was good. 
Just wanted God. Just wanted his presence, nothing else. Talk about it becoming an enterprise. We always want something, don't we, from God? Deliverance, power, a job. We always seem to want something. Joshua just wanted God. Just wanted God. And that's what made him special. That's what made him who he was. David was the same, just wanted God. He said, Mo, at the time I gave this order to Joshua, your eyes have seen everything Adonai your God has done to these two kings. Adonai will do the same to all the kingdoms you encounter when you cross over. Haber, Hebrews, Haber, cross over. Don't be afraid of him. Does Adonai your God, he'll fight on your behalf. You've seen everything he's done, Josh. And he'd seen it all. A lot of us have seen a lot of stuff. Not to Joshua's extent. But all the things you've seen, all, all, all the testimonies you've heard, all the miracles you might have witnessed. Some incredible things that God has done, great and small. And you know it's the Lord in your life. You know it. Your eyes have seen Your eyes have seen. You can't live off Moses' revelation. Or his relationship. You, 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 you've got to get in the tent and grab your own ember. You've got to get with the Lord. Don't you? How many start the day with the Lord? How many? We do it for a while. And we feel energized when we do. We feel great. Because you're letting the spirit dictate. And he's going to control your emotions. He's going to control your thinking. How you walk physically. And it feels great. But then, then, then we open that gate. And we let the world in. And we get distracted. And we get busy. And then time passes by. And time passes so very quickly now. Doesn't it? Have you noticed? And then before you know it, months have gone by. And you're like, to, to be honest, I've not, I've not been with the Lord. I've not been in his word. I've not been in his presence for so long. But what do you expect? That's in your control. You've got the power to change that and it's an easy fix. Immediately, he's there easy fix putting his hand out for you always knocking on the door always you just got to open the door your eyes have seen everything Adonai has done so don't be afraid God's going to fight on your behalf they never saw the Egyptians again did they because Adonai did battle and he will fight for you and that's an amazing thing to hold on to. Not to put him to the test. Not to do something sinful and say, Lord, could you bless it? Can you anoint it? No, 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 no. You've got to do it his way. You do it your way. And then you'll get peace. Then you'll get protection. Then you'll get blessing, spiritual blessing. I'm not interested in money. Money comes, money goes. Nothing to do with money. Faith's never been about money. Never ever. Spiritual blessing. So the key to all of this is that the Lord's not depending on your faith. We're depending on his faithfulness. We're not holding on to him that well. We can't. Don't build your part up too much. 
but he's holding on to us. He's the one marching around us. He's the one who puts the edge around us. He's the one surrounding us 24-7. He's the one who's there sitting on the end of your bed waiting for you to wake up. Hey, Karina, how are you? Because he does. It's all on the Lord, the greatness of God, the depth of his incredible, indescribable love that he's got for his children. There's not enough words to describe how over the top his love is. The creator, the sustainer of the universe, head over heels in love with every one of you. The world's going to chew you up and spit you out, give you a kick in and laugh at you. But the Lord accepts you, whoever you are, warts and all. Warts and all. Accepts you for what you are. Wipes that slate clean. And he delights in you. He loves you. Because you're special to him. You don't need the world. You don't need the compliments of the world. You don't need to be accepted by the world. All you have to do is do what Joshua did and hang in the tent. And let him speak what he wants to speak. Into your heart. You only need him. Let him do it. I'll, I'll guarantee you it's a blessing. One last thing. Joshua. He made an incredible statement. Very, very powerful. Adonai gave to Israel the entire land that he swore to give them to the fathers. They took possession of it. They settled in it. Adonai gave them rest on all sides just as he'd swore to the fathers. Not one man of all their enemies withstood them. For Adonai gave all their enemies into the hand. Not one good thing that Adonai had promised to the house of Israel failed. Not one. All came to pass. Powerful now. So when we think of his promises, we can think, well, the Lord promised me. He said I'd be married by now. He said I'd be here in my career by now. Well, this is much, much bigger. Much bigger. In the Hebrew, promise is the bar. It's more than a promise, it's speech. It's an utterance, it's a word, or words, sayings, decrees, declarations, conversations. So every single thing spoken of in the Bible that God would do for the children of Israel, which we are grafted into, or reinstated if you're Jewish. It means you can claim every promise. I told you, you've got to get your head around this as a born again believer. It's a must for your faith. It's a must. And when you grasp it, your Bible and your faith, it's going to make a lot more sense. You belong to the Lord forever. Don't ever let the enemy tell you any different. Special treasure. Say go out. In times of old, I've told people before, when they fought a battle and the king would do the raid and they'd get all the booty and all the treasure and he'd line all the treasure up and he'd walk up and down and he'd go I want that one I want that there that will be my segalo my special treasure that's how he thinks about every one of you special treasure every one of you you're the pearl people go oh, the, the pearl's the kingdom no you're the pearl you're the pearl in his hand he loves you to bits
gifted beyond anything you can imagine. All you've got to do is trust him. And he tells us, I'm going to be with you always to the very end of the age. Always. Because he loves us and his love is true love. And there's no greater love than that. Amen. Amen. Shabbat shalom.